that if you're a wheelchair user. So, once again, I discussed with them the fact that the gra of the gravity issue, some people are very curious of how I am able to do that in the water with my wheelchair. How do you get the wheelchair over rock formations and through all the different places? And you know, you have a little bit of fun with folks and you try to explain to them how you do that. Then you finally come clean and say, no, I don't. I don't have to do it that way. I get out of my wheelchair like anybody else would. But there's some methodology uh, for doing that. And so that whole concept of being a wheelchair diver overlapped into a program that we were able to start about 11 or 12 years ago called Day of Discovery, which is a scuba experience for children 8 to 14 years old that have any conceivable special need. I take them all. So I'll give you an example. Here I am talking to some kids at the aquarium, at the site where we do this program. And you'll see kids with a variety of, of uh, disabilities. This young lady has cerebral palsy. She's in a wheelchair. You'll see my dive team working with the kids. We have two special dive buddies for each one of our kids. So our kids get in the water and put the gear on you see in front of us here. We don't use the old traditional wetsuits. If anyone's ever worn a wetsuit, especially prior to their injury, you can only imagine how difficult it is to get a wetsuit on somebody with a physical disability. It can be done, but it's hard. And you, the, the sheer uh, design of wetsuits, which allow a thin layer of water inside that your body heats, that keeps you warm, doesn't work with us where we have uh, muscle loss and we, we just can't fill that gap between our bones and the wetsuit, so we just end up being cold. So we use a system called a dry suit, very loose fitting suit. We wear our clothes underneath, we wear layers underneath, we can wear sweatshirts and sweatpants. Some divers who really, a, a lot of my quad friends who are divers actually wear electric socks, electric long john underwear that a, that a hunter would use to keep them nice and toasty warm. Very tight fitting seals around the neck, around the wrists and the ankles, and a zipper off of an astronaut spacesuit is how we keep the water out. So that's the issue number one. But we're dealing with kids, very fragile kids, so everything's miniaturized. Little tiny air tanks, the regulators, everything that we use is, is miniaturized. Some of my kids, let's see if we have a slide here that might uh, depict this. Some of these kids, don't have the muscular control in their mouths, like some of these kids you see here, they just barely hold themselves together. Some of them can't hold that dive regulator in their mouth. Their mouths just don't work to allow them to do that. But to me, that's a ridiculous excuse not to, not to try scuba. So for those kids, we've got full face masks that cover their entire face. My good friend Bob Spizak, a retired firefighter, probably recognizes this with very similar uh, use in, in the fire service. But basically it covers the whole face and mouth, so that somebody who can't bite down on a scuba regulator can still experience the, uh, the joy. So this, this overlaps, obviously, to adults as well who are interested in scuba diving, all the equipment that we have here. And a lot of folks will ask me, too many pictures of me in here. A lot of folks will ask me, if I can't swim, or if I can't move my legs or my arms, how, do I, how am I gonna float? How am I gonna keep the system working? Well, we wear a vest. It's an inflatable vest. It actually hooks up to our air supply, so we don't have to sit there and huff and puff and blow this thing up. So we can make ourselves float perfectly on the, on the top of the water. We can dump some of that air out and let ourselves drop to a certain depth put a little air in it and, and level off. So we have complete control regardless of whether our legs or arms work. And once again, we have a lot of certified quad divers who um, love being in the water. Now they can't really motivate themselves to the water very well, so part of our certification is we must dive with two rescue certified able-bodied dive buddies. So if need be, they will cruise us around in the water. We just kind of sit back and enjoy the ride. The only issue with that is they burn up their air faster than we do because they're doing all the work. So it's time to go to the surface before we're ready to go to the surface and we have to have a, a discussion with them. So some of the areas, my primary focus for my diving at the aquarium, and those of you that have been to the aquarium in Monterey are 
crown jewel exhibit is the kelp forest. And that's my primary uh, exhibit of diving. This is the top of the kelp forest. And there I am getting my getting geared up at the very top. Well, I'm on the roof, and you'll see just behind the railing there, the, um, the, the top of the great tide pool, and the fact that I can't put my gear on with 30, 38 pounds of lead is what it takes me to get down to the bottom. I can't put that on and walk into the water like an able-bodied diver could. So how, how am I going to deal with that? So I put all my gear together, including my inflatable vest, blow that thing up. I have the aquarium's put in a little crane for me that I use to, to crane up my, my rig out over the exhibit, lower it down in the water, and it floats on its own because I've inflated it. I don't have any lead on me because when I go humping down, oh, empty wheelchair there, so obviously I'm on my way. Um, <laughs> down, down the steps to get in the water, I, I get in the water and I'm not weighted yet. I swim over to my rig, put my rig on, buckle it all up, dump the air out of it, and I'm on my way. And when I'm in this kelp forest, like I am right here, uh, getting ready to, to vacuum, that's one of my jobs, people can't really tell that I'm a, a, a paraplegic. Uh, the water kind of hides that for me. I even actually wear fins to, to stabilize me. I wear the old-fashioned old black rubber fins that stabilize me in the water. There I am with my vacuum cleaner hose, just cruising along. Big uh, male sheep head right below me there. And you can see, I'm just kind of poking along. I do the Johnny Weissmiller thing. I pull myself through the water with my hands, because I can, because I'm a para. We actually have web gloves, too, for people to wear that can really pull themselves through the water. And we swim mostly to kind of an inverted um, vertical, horizontal position. There I am at the window. So a lot of you are working on it. I love working with the kids. I'll get right to the window. The kids will come right to the railing there. I've got this big mustache, so I'm, they kind of dub me as the uh, the house walrus, if you will. <laughs> More kids interacting. The kids love to see the divers. And with Philly Flow, when I get out of the water, and here I'm showing the kids how thick the glass is on the window. My hand's on one side of the glass, and his is on the other side of the glass. So it shows kids that that window is about seven and a quarter inches thick. So people get a kind of an interesting uh, kick out of that. Uh, here I am showing them. That's how thick it is. Waving goodbye, heading back to the surface. More kids. I've had more pictures taken with kids standing in front of me in front of the exhibit. It's kind of cool to uh, to be able to do that. And kids have a. I'm heading back up to the surface now, and that's basically how that works. Um, our program for special needs kids is about as warm and fuzzy of an experience as you can uh, imagine. Um, we've got kids who, who don't normally get to do things like this, doing things like this. And our hope is maybe in the fall when they go back to school and the teacher asks them what they did this summer they can tell the rest of the kids in the class who've maybe been picking on them a little bit because nobody can be crueler to kids than kids. But I went scuba diving this summer, so that, hopefully that would cushion that, um, that bullying they get at school. We're able to gear them up. I have kids that are visually impaired who are blind, so we and we use the great tide pool out behind the great the, the aquarium, so we skip the ocean. We stock it with critters. There's rock formations. There's stuff in there for kids to touch. So we'll take the gloves off, the diver's glove off, off of our kids with visual impairments. Let them feel all these formations and feel the starfish that we bring up to them and some of the other critters that we bring in. We have kids that are hearing impaired. We have the full spectrum of cognitive disabilities, the full spectrum of physical disabilities. So believe it or not, I've got young kids with spinal cord injuries. Some of these kids. I don't know the proper word, became spinal cord injured during the birth process. We have some kids that have been in car accidents who were, who were tied into their car seats, and the car accident was bad enough that their head flipped or their back and they broke. So I have two young cousins that have dived, been diving with us who are now aged out, who are driving cross country with their family. The car was in a wreck, and both cousins sustained spinal cord injuries. 
So, I mean, all of us have a story, right? We all have a story, and these two young kids. So we get them in the water on scuba gear, and they're just all over the place. Some of these kids, we have to actually take a second tank of air down and because they'll burn the first one up. We want them to keep going. It's an hour and a half long program. We are able to pay for 105 families to come into the aquarium at no charge. We are able to pay for those kids to participate in our scuba program. It would normally be $95. We do that program all summer long for all typical kids. But their moms and dads have to pay their way into the aquarium, and their moms and dads have to pay for them to take part in that scuba program. I'm sorry, Steve? That's right. The question was the age range of the kids that we have in this program. For our everyday typical kids program, it's 8 to 13. So they can do it through their 13th year. The aquarium is, is granted me an extra year. So my kids are good 8 to 14 years old. They can do it all the way through their 14th year, and then they're out of the program. They have to, the, the, the idea is, at least the aquarium holds on to the idea that at 14 years old, you can go out and get certified to be a scuba diver. Most of my kids aren't going to do that. Either their families can't afford it, the kids really aren't that capable, and the difficulty is you can't go diving unless you've got two dive buddies with you all. It's tough to make that all work. So, um, But at least get to give them a chance to try something that, uh, once again, not even a lot of able-bodied kids or typical kids get to do. We're the only aquarium in the country that offers a program for special needs kids we're one of two aquariums in the country that has a program for typical kids. So we literally have families bringing their kids from all over the country to take part in this program, especially families that have our children with terminal illnesses. Those families want to pack as much into that little short lifetime as they can. They are willing to travel. Uh, organizations like Make-A-Wish, um, for the first eight years we had the program, we had to do our own fundraising, but now we have an organization called Children's Miracle Network who is funding our program. So now I can just spend all my time recruiting kids, visiting schools. Um, I've got a video. If, if there's any questions, any questions coming in, Robert, about scuba diving? What? No. Okay. The, the big question, I think. You know, I was actually talking to my, uh, my guest today to watch my serial and uh, they have uh, a nephew who has a disability. I think it's uh, an MS, multiple sclerosis. And I was telling her about your program, and they were like, oh, yeah, they just went to it. And so they must have come recently, and they were telling me all these great things about it. And I went, oh, so I think you know, Mark was one of the guys who started getting to go to so you've been doing it as many years as we have. You're going to run into, into families um, whose kids have done it. We, we've had over a 1,000 kids come through this program. We get a lot of repeat kids, and we encourage repeat kids. Um, they may be a little nervous the first time they come, and the next year they're a year older, a year braver. They may be willing to put on a little bit more equipment and try a little bit further. Those of us who, who, who are grown-ups like ourselves, who are wheelchair users and want to scuba dive, a lot of the questions are, where would I go to do that? I can't schlep through the sand on the beach. How am I going to get in the water? We do beach diving, but it is very difficult. You have to have working you down there in your wheelchair. We use pieces of plywood. We leapfrog the pieces of plywood so we can get down there and chair. Once you get on the hard sand, you're you're pretty good shape. You get out of your chair on the sand, you put your gear on. Now you got to deal with the surf. And the surf is a whole other issue. So our best diving, and the diving we do most frequently, is from a boat. We go out on chartered dive boats. We've had as many as eight of us at one time, a couple of quads, and most of us paras. We've had folks who have a spina bifida, cerebral palsy. Once we get on that boat, the first thing they do is they take a hose and they wet the deck so we can bunny hop and slide across the deck. We get to the transom of the boat, we get down on the transom landing, they'll put our rig on for us, buckle it all up, you roll forward in the water, now you're scuba diving just like everybody else does. You take the anchor line down to the bottom, you take a reading on your compass, and we all dive with computers, you find out where you're at, you can find that anchor line on the way back, and then off you go. The problem with diving with able-bodied dive buddies is that they tend to swim too fast. And so they're going past everything that you want to see. I get down to the rocky bottom, and I just pull myself over the rocky bottom. I'm looking at little holes for eels and for a little red octopus, and they're long gone. And i got to stay with them. They're, they're my lifeline, so I'm grabbing them by the fins, and I'm trying to get them to come back. So, But the point is, it is very doable for just about any conceivable um, special need. 
And that's, that, that's the ice that I would like to break with this program. Is, and um, if anyone really is interested in finding out more about it, then uh, Robert can, can get you my email address. You can email me. I can give you some leads on, on where to go and, um, and get certified. So if there aren't any more questions, then I'd like to share with you a video from one of our days of discovery. This was uh, this day of discovery 2011, but they're all the same. We don't change anything, and it's all pretty much the same uh, process each time. The faces change every year, but take a look at this, and maybe we'll see if there's some questions afterwards. You can, you can probably lie about your age and get, and get away with it. Yeah, yeah. We, if, if those of you who have been to the aquarium can remember, or those of you who haven't, off of the back deck of the aquarium, down a flight of about 28 steps, we have what's called the Great Tide Pool. It's a human-made tide pool. It's separated from the ocean with a stone wall, but it is tidal action. On big surf days, we have to stop the program because the waves are crashing into the great tide pool. But otherwise, it's a very safe environment. We stock it every morning with big starfish, crabs, hermit crabs. We have a rock formation with a couple of uh, um, monkey-faced eels living in there so the kids can experience this whole thing. The word dive is a bit of a stretch. None of our kids go underwater. It's strictly a surface event. You'll see it in the videos. They are face down in the water, breathing scuba. The divers are bringing up things for the kids to see, feel, and touch. So, Robert, if you're ready to... Yeah. Just, uh, Cynthia, did you have a good time today? Yeah. Uh, yes. And did you go scuba diving today? Uh, yeah. Was it your first time scuba diving in the ocean? Uh, uh -huh, I think so. Did you see some animals down there? Uh, Let me think. You, did you see a starfish? Uh, yeah. Did you see a crab? Uh, yeah. Was the water cold today? Uh, uh, What's your name? <laughs> What's your Abby. You're Abby. How come you're at the aquarium today, Abby? Birthday. Oh, it's your birthday. And did your sister come to the aquarium too? What's your sister's name? Lily. Lily. What did Lily do today at the aquarium? Did she do something here? What did she do? Scuba dive. Did you scuba dive? Mm -hmm. You're probably not old enough yet, huh? You'll have to come back and scuba dive with us sometime. If there were some other kids that wanted to come scuba diving someday, what would you tell those kids? Would you tell those kids something about coming scuba diving? What would you tell them? You have to be eight. You have to be eight. And they too hot. Check with the PBS, get that on and find out what I'm talking. You think they're going to film you on, and put you on PBS? That sounds good. We'll try to get you on PBS if we can. Famous diver now. Otherwise, it'll, it will, it'll be on our website, so you'll be able to see it there, all right? In about 15 years, when you have a thousand dives, you can actually come back, and this will be my first log dive. And look, there are your dive buddies. That's Pamela. And what was my name? Patrick. And how do we remember Patrick? SpongeBob's best friend. So, 
what we also do, the nice people that were up here were nice enough to put the location that you dove, which was the Great Tide Pool here at the aquarium on August 24, 2011. Your dive program was at 1030. They said it was 56, it was more 52, but we'll say 56, <laughs> and their temperature was 70. Mid-tide, the tide is actually going to be high this afternoon, partly cloudy because we're still fighting that little fog bank. But look at this, here's our checklist, and we're going to go through a checklist of all the animals that we saw out there. Oh, you got your diver's log. Everybody gets one of those, and look at the inside of it. Your picture's in there with your dive buddies. Very cool. That smile tells it all. Yeah. Matthew, what, what kind of suit is that you got on? Uh, dry suit. Did it really keep you dry? Yes. So the clothes that you have on right now, you had on underneath the dry suit, is that what you're telling me? Yes. Well, I guess the name dry suit really works, huh? Yes. So what was it? I saw a lot of algae. You saw, saw a lot, a lot of, of algae. algae. Oh. oh, did you see that? Yeah. Algae. I, I, every usually people go straight for the fish. <laughs> nice. Saw algae. Yeah, there's what a lot else of did algae we see? out there for sure. See some crabs? We saw a starfish. We saw a starfish or sea. How come your clothes aren't wet? Because I have a, I had a dry suit on. Ah, uh, dry suit. <laughs> Tyler, is this your first time scuba diving in the ocean? Yes. What do you think about it? It's awesome. Awesome, I love that. If there were some other kids that might want to try this, what would you tell them? It is awesome, come here. What's your name? Ryan. Hi Ryan, I noticed that your hair is all wet. Why is that? Because I went diving. <laughs> you went diving? That's pretty amazing. What kind? Did you wear some special equipment, or were you out there cold? I wore some special equipment. And it kept you warm. Yeah. How did that work? Um, I wore a dry suit. Oh, a dry suit. So I guess they call it a dry suit because it kept you dry. Yeah. Did you see some pretty cool animals while you were out there? Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, I saw a. Uh, Hermit crab, monkey face seal, gumboot ch chitin, mm -hmm. bat star, knobby sea star, keyhole limpet, giant green anemone, sand dab, red algae, green algae, brown algae. Now what's that book that you're reading? It's, it's a... It's my log book of, of the diving. Oh, very cool. Is, is your picture in there? Yeah, in the very front page. I saw sea, sea cucumber, um, hermit crabs, monkey feast steel, um, and then lots of bat stars and lots of sand crabs. Very nice. Went. So Katie, how come your hair is all wet? Because I went to the scuba diving. Scuba diving? Wow! Now what did you think about scuba diving? Very fine. All right, Katie, did you go diving by yourself today or did you have a couple of dive buddies go with you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember your dive buddies' names? Mm, Justin and her. Maybe we'll ask Shannon. your dive buddies' names. Justin? I'm Shannon. All right, well, it looks like we have another scuba diver here today. Why don't you tell me your name real quick? Um, I am Kenny Jakes. Kind of give me an idea what you thought about it. Um, well, tell you the truth, I'm not much of a natural swimmer. Um, like a while back, the first time I went scuba diving, I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be hard and all, but I went into the water, got all the gear on, and it was, it was really fun. What kind of things did you see out there today? Um, I saw starfish, I saw eels, um, I saw a lot of, you know, algae. It was pretty nice. So who do we have here today? Lola. Lola. So tell me what you did today. I scuba dived. How did you do with the taste of the salt water? Did you get some salt water in your mouth? Yes. Yeah. Was it okay? Yes. Yeah. If you had the chance to go scuba diving with us again, would you do it? Yes. 
Hi there. What's your name? Zachary. You're Zachary. What did you do today, Zachary? I went scuba diving. It, the crab decorates itself by putting seaweed on it. So what's your name? Sarah. You're Sarah. And what did you do today? What? Scuba diving. Uh, and was scuba diving fun? Yeah. What did you see when you were scuba diving? Did you see anything? Pretty much a lot of starfish. Oh yeah, we have lots of starfish here. A hermit crab. Was, was there any part of it you didn't like? Just that it was kind of salty. Kind of salty, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of salty. That's the way the ocean is, huh? How about other kids that have never tried this before? What would you tell other kids? It's fun. It's fun. So who am I talking with today? I'm Debbie Lillo, and I'm the church relations coordinator for Johnny and Friends. Johnny and Friends. Tell me about that. Johnny and Friends is a faith-based organization that supports families affected by disabilities. So we help them plug into churches locally. We help the churches do respite events and Sunday programming, and we run a camp for the families every summer. And so why are you here at the aquarium today? Because you let us bring five families each year to enjoy the blessings of swimming out with the animals and being loved on by your volunteers and enjoying the aquarium. Special quick release pockets in our dive gear. So if you get into trouble, you got to get rid of your lead if you're out of air or you're suffering some sort of a physical uh, issue. You want to get rid of your lead. The pouches that the lead come in are replaceable. The lead's replaceable. To replace your pouches and lead is probably about $100, $150. Most divers that are found deceased who have drowned, who are on the bottom, still have all their lead on board. I ain't giving up that 150 bucks for the lead. And then they, they pay for it with their lives. So it's a lesson that we, we try to cram in. No, it's, it's pellets, pelletized and it's in bags. So you get bags of different denominations, one pound bags, two pounds. We also have clip-on weights. Uh, that you, if you're in a situation where you little, need a little extra weight that day, you can clip on a couple of kind of plastic coated uh, weights. So, um, you, the, 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 the question was how much weight do you use and what do you base that on? It is based on your personal um, flotation. Everybody has a different um, neutral and what kind of water you're diving in, what kind of gear you're wearing. What you want to do is when you get to get to depth, you want to be what we call neutral. You don't want to go up, you don't want to go down. If you have to keep putting air in your, into your vest to make yourself neutral because you get heavier the deeper you go, that water pressure squeezes all the air out of you, it squeezes everything and everything shrinks up. Now all of a sudden you're heavier. Then every time you fill up your what we call your buoyancy compensator with air, you're stealing air from your from your tank. So you don't want to do that. So everybody has to learn to be perfectly neutrally buoyant, you're at the surface of the water with all your stuff on, no air in any of your equipment, and your, the water line should be right across the front of your, of your face mask. Now it just takes a little bit of swish of the arms, you go down, you break that, that first barrier, and then now you're on your way down. Some people put so much lead in their gear, they dump their air and down they go, which is okay, you can do that, but it's gonna cost you, it's more energy to swim, and more air um, to keep playing around with your BC. The question is, do I always die with two buddies? That's that's part of my certification. Um, the reason being, in in my particular instance, being a paraplegic, I can still move my arms, but I can still have an issue um, at depth where I get. Um, the bend, they call it the bends with decompression sickness where I'm totally out of commission. I need a couple of guys to get me back to the wall, off the surface of the water to get me into a safe situation. One of those divers has to go for help. Um, so that's, and that really rule really should apply to all typical divers as well. 
um, but it's okay to dive with a single dive buddy. Um, but for someone who who is a uh, dive with a disability and has a disability certification card, it's going to be a minimum of two quads. Oftentimes, that they have four dive buddies. They do. They, and the question was, what, what are their certifications? There's a, there's a series of certifications that divers can have. The very basic is an open water certification, and the next one that you put on top of that is a rescue certification. How to get someone to the surface, how to do buddy breathing, how to do uh, uh, CPR, all those things that, that rescue divers learn to do. We retrain every year at the aquarium on that, so it's an ongoing thing. Um, I, I wouldn't want to dive with somebody who wasn't rescue certified. They could get me out of trouble. Part of the issue, one of the biggest problems that divers have is what's called decompression sickness. Those of us that have paralysis, we already bring about half of the symptoms to the table that somebody would use as a triage to find out whether you're suffering from decompression sickness or not. Numbness of the legs, lack of motion in the legs, all these things that we already have, but some, a typical able-bodied person that would have decompression sickness would notice, I can't feel my legs. I can't move my legs, but you've got to make sure your dive buddies know that you already bring those issues to the table so if they think you've uh, suffered decompression sickness, which is generally a case of coming up too quick, nitrogen bubbles in your, in your bloodstream don't have a chance to purge out, and then, you, uh, then you're hurting. So these are things that obviously what I call wheelchair divers, but it's not fair to say that because there's people with other special needs who dive. But those of us with special needs have to be aware of when when we dive. What else? People who are interested in finding out more about diving with a disability, first of all, there are dive companies all over the world that do nothing but specialize in, um, in divers with disabilities. So you can go to warm water diving, there's all kinds of really cool places you can go where you stay in hotels, they take you out, there's even dive boats where you stay on the dive boats for, for several days. There's an organization in the United States that will uh, will help certify you as HSA, Handicap Scuba Association. Most of your best and better dive centers will generally have an HSA certified instructor. So the first thing you want to do is go to a dive center who's got a pool, put some gear on, have them throw you in, and see if you like it. See if you feel comfortable with it. See if it's something you feel you can do with your disability. It's not for everybody. If it was for everybody, we'd be elbow to elbow out there, so it's, it's a sport that not everybody participates in. Some people can't clear their ears. You ever deep dive eight, 10 foot deep swimming pool and feel that burn and needles in your ears? There's a way to overcome that on scuba, but some people can't because of the design of their airway, their noses, their eustachian tubes. So physically, some people can't. People with heart conditions, people with uh, implants, um, there's a number of things that would, would preclude you from becoming a scuba diver. So it's things that you need to find out. Um, you know, somebody that's interested in uh, children's program have to be about getting that information out the question is, if you know a family or a family member or somebody who has a child interested in Day of Discovery, how do you pursue that? All that comes through me. Um, so I can make my, uh, I have car business cards with my uh, all the information on it. What I do with every first time family is call them on the phone and go through the entire program with them to make sure that they are comfortable with their child doing an event like this. Most of the time, the kids are raring to go. It's the moms and dads that I got to deal with. Uh, moms and dads who maybe their father threw them in the, in the water when they were a kid and it was sink or swim, and they haven't gotten near the water since. But that's not fair to pin that on your kids. Let's give your kids a shot at it. And that's, what I, that's why I've got several videos on my website. So people can go to the website, watch the videos, get a flavor for it. But it all comes through me. And I love to recruit kids. Robert, the, the, the family that you knew, that you discovered, came through the program. I don't do any advertising. Most of us don't for the kind of things that you can do with a disability. Most of us wouldn't know where to advertise. Most of us are working on a shoestring uh, budget, so we wouldn't want to spend the money for that in the first place. 
It's word of mouth. It's one person telling another person, hey, have you heard about this program? It's pretty awesome for your kids to participate in. And that's, now we've been doing it enough years that it's, I, I dropped the flag in January and it only takes me a month or two to fill up 105 spots now. So. Now our, uh, in, uh, so with Dr. Shen, who again links our, uh, well, she used to run out of the thing. She do something else, that, right? Um, but she, uh, still, uh, still was putting together this final bit of picnic that I mentioned. I think eventually I would like for you to come and just do a, a brief presentation on her program. Because I know the last meeting we had, I think, like 65 kids that attended that program. So, uh, that meeting that we had. I like to, I'll coordinate that with you. And, and those are, those are opportunities I jump all over. Uh, blow up in Berkeley, I've gone to some of their wheelchair basketball games, and all I do is set my table up, and I have to remind kids, hey, you're supposed to be out there playing basketball. You know, so because they get really wound up with this. Or my service dog, the same thing. Kids are, get really curious about that. So I would love to come. The only thing I can't do that I have been asked to do is to come to an event like that with gear, and put the kids in the water and have them try out gear. Obviously, I am not an instructor, and even if I was, I couldn't do it by myself. I wouldn't try to do it by myself. So um, we've done programs like that on a big scale where we bring in some uh, able-bodied dive buddies. And we, put, we did a 24-hour scuba event when we first started this, an organization like this at the swimming pool at um, Los Gatos High School when they opened up the new swim center there. So I had divers in the water rotating every hour. We had cables set up in the deep end with underwater games to be played, checkers, chess, you name it. Divers rotated through through that 24-hour period. They were coming from all over, and they brought pledges with them. And so at, uh, the school let us use the facility. That's how we got the facility introduced to the community, and we made some money for a new, pro a new organization that we were working back then called Accessible Events, and that organization has been disbanded. but. I grabbed onto the day of discovery portion of it. Rich Patterson, rest his, rest his soul, grabbed on to the uh, glider flying portion of it that we did. And we did glider flying with Richard until, until Richard passed, and then there hasn't been anybody that really wanted to, to take up the glider flying program. So um, that's kind of some of, the, some of the ways that we raised money over the years. A lot of friends, a lot of neighbors, a kindness of others to how you run organizations like this. So. With that, that's it. I've got some still photography if anyone wants to see some of the kids. You probably saw in the video, at least you hope, I hope you did, but you don't see a good mix in every one video of the different um, disabilities. Uh, a lot of the kids who, who seem to be the most profoundly disabled are kids with high level cerebral palsy. And what most people don't understand about CP is it's strictly a physical disability. Those kids are as smart as smart can be but it doesn't look like it when you see them in their chairs and some of them can't speak, some of them are using computers to speak, but they basically are dealing with a physical disability. And so I try to get people to understand that, yes, these kids can go scuba diving and, and love to do it, so. I mean, it's obvious, you know, in your interview, just, just tell them it's, you know, so I know yeah, yeah. Watching the kids being interviewed is, you really do. It's, you see the magic, the warm and fuzzy that I call it. And that's what, why it makes a good video for, for people who are on the fence about whether they should do something like this. The kids sell the program, and there's nothing but the program to sell because we, we don't charge families to do this. Um, the average cost for an adult to get in the Monterey Aquarium is about $40. Kids are about $30. It's $95 for the scuba program. I have families that come to this program who have never been to the aquarium, could never afford to do that. We're 20 minutes away from the Salinas Valley. We have migrant farm working families who are 20 minutes away whose kids have never seen the ocean, let alone been in it or been to the aquarium. So that one day I get to bring them to the aquarium, I get to show them the ocean, and then I get to throw them into the ocean. And so you can imagine how that how that impacts some some families of. Uh, of uh, no, I I get three days out of the summer program, which starts around the middle of June and runs all the way to Labor Day, four times a day, every day for all typical kids. The aquarium gives me three of those days, and I have 35 kids each day for for my total of 105 kids for the three days. The aquarium gives me such an incredible deal. 
and now the aquarium has taken on the cost of the program, but when we were paying for it ourselves, that to do it more than three days was really putting the aquarium in the red, because we're in the red anyway with, with a program like this. We're a nonprofit institution. So you had your hand up in the back? Yeah, the age. The age, uh, you probably came in after we started the program, which is perfectly fine to ask that age again. The age for our everyday typical kids program is eight to 13. And for Dave Discovery, for kids with special needs is eight to 14, or what is it, did I say eight to 14? Eight to 13 for my typical kids program, eight to 14 for the special needs kids program, which means they can do it through and including their 14th year. But they gotta be eight to do it the first time. The, the question was, is there any disability um, that would preclude somebody from participating? The only thing that I preached all these years and that I've told everybody is we cannot take somebody vent dependent. I can't say that anymore. Vent. We got a fellow back in Minnesota who's vent dependent who had a custom made dry suit for him, a team of six divers, his father's up in a boat like the Wizard of Oz with these 100 foot lines running down to his trach, but it's incredibly expensive, but it can be done. But realistically, anybody on a full-time vent, it, we, for obvious reasons, we can't do it. So. Are you cool for this? I'm sorry? Are you cool for this? I'm, I'm not completely full yet for this summer's, um, agenda. Um, what I've learned over the years is I get some last minute cancellations. A child will wake up ill that morning, a child has changed their mind, so I bring five alternate families and their kids to the aquarium each day, which means they get a whole day at the aquarium and a pretty good chance of getting in the water. So I still have some alternate, alternate slots to fill. And I try to make a balance between cognitive and physical disabilities. So right now to kind of finish up the, uh, the key diver, Part of it, I'm looking for some kids with physical disabilities. And then I'll start plugging in uh, kids with cognitive disabilities, um, in which I'm already doing into my alternate list of kids. Probably in the next. Process, talking to parents, understanding their total disability, quirks, and things like that. It is in terms of what their disability is and what the parents are comfortable with them doing. It is. It's, it, I'll spend 15 minutes on the phone with, with families going over, and then when I'm done explaining point A to point B, what we do in that hour and a half of which we'll have 35 or 40 minutes of it, the kids are in the water. Um, the parents will often have questions. I don't think my child can do that because. And those are the questions I love to field because I generally have an answer. I, my child can't do that because I know they would never be able to hold a regulator in their mouth, but I got a fix for that. So you get into the water the parents like long so they're No, the parents were there. Yeah, in fact, the, parent, the, the question was, where are the parents when the kids are doing this? I, I want the parents sitting down with the kids and we're suiting them up to meet the die buddies. I want the parents, because they know their kids better than we do, to discuss any uh, idiosyncrasies that that kid has. Uh, maybe the, kid doesn't, the child doesn't speak. Maybe the child doesn't hear. We need the parents there that maybe speak ASL to help the child get through that part of the process. But once the child's suited up and down the stairs we go, mom and dad, the siblings, everybody else stays on the top deck. The great tide pool is bound on three sides by the deck so they can follow their child around. They're within speaking distance. The kids are about 12, 15 feet below the deck. Um, Taking pictures, video, but no, the family is there. They're not leaving them like they would at a camp. I want the family there. I want them to see this. I want them to see us do stuff with their kids that they don't believe they could ever do with their kids. But that's kids, period, right? Most people say, I can't believe what my kids did when they were up to your house for a sleepover. You're telling me what my kids did. Well, they won't do that for mom and dad, but they, they cleared the table after they're through eating. They don't do that at home, you know, so stuff like that. Same thing with the scuba program. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I appreciate getting to just show my little piece of uh, of the world and, and what it means to, to us to be doing this. And once again, if you have, uh, there was a time when I was all done with the discuss, discussion I would ask for, so if anyone can financially help, that would be very cool. But I don't have to do that anymore, which is very cool. 
I don't like going out and begging for money. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your. Uh, your I'm sorry. I I I um, try to dry suit. Doesn't work for me. I tend to overheat. I get very hot. The problem for me is the air would get into the legs and the ankles, and I go upside down, and that it was just a mess. Yeah, dry suits. I, I dive wet, but I have a custom-made wetsuit that fits me very snug and tight around my legs, you know, where all the muscle atrophy is. And um, so I still dive, you know, in a wetsuit, but pretty comfortable. By the time I burn the tank of air at depth, I, I, I'm getting chilly, and it's time to get out. Um, that's a good indicator for getting out of the water when you're cold. When you're cold, you burn up air faster. And we're diving for fun. We're not diving for business. So when it's cold, it's time to get out. What else? Do I take up too much time? Okay. All right. But I'm here. Yes, Don? So uh, what do you have to do to be a volunteer? To be a volunteer for... The, the, the question was, what do you do if you want to be a volunteer as part of our program? The needs of our volunteers are, are great enough. For instance, our divers. We have volunteer divers that come in to supplement our dive staff. In our everyday typical kids program, it's three or four kids per diver. In my program, it's two divers per child. So I got to bring in extra divers. So obviously, that's very controlled. But we do have civilian divers that come in that are rescue certified that want to be there that day. The help on the deck uh, with our kids um, is once again pretty structured. The aquarium has has some guidelines um, about helping on the deck. Where I use friends and kids who have aged out is to have you come to the aquarium that day to be one of my ambassadors. And what an ambassador does, I have a little cheat sheet about how the program works, is just to mingle with our everyday guests at the aquarium that have no idea what it is we're doing. How come those empty youth wheelchairs are over there? How come they're carrying that child out of the water? That's what we want to share with our guests at the aquarium, and that's what some of our volunteers that, that aren't really involved in, in the program. Bob Spizak, for instance, has been helping us for years. Bob helps us. Connie's outside. My wife Connie's outside checking all the families in. The families have to be checked in, and then we have to escort them into the aquarium because they're not paying to get in. We have name tags for the kids. I got 35 kids coming that day. It's a fair amount of work. So Bob's there. He, he volunteers, and that's what he's been doing for us for years. Back in the day, and this might embarrass Bob, when we were uh, had to, to recruit our own funding, Bob would pass the fire boot around the firehouse and, and bring in some, some really nice uh, donations to keep the program running. Now that we don't do that anymore, Bob donates his time. He spends the whole day there with us. We cut off check-in at 12 o'clock noon, even though we have a 12.30 and a 2.30 dive event, because we want everybody to come in and enjoy the, the aquarium, and then Bob's in there hanging out and just watching the whole thing uh, develop before his very eyes, where he was out front helping check the kids in. So those are the areas where um, where volunteers uh, can help us. Um, we have volunteer guides that are there that did that day volunteering their time to escort the families in. They have to obviously be an aquarium guide to be able to do that, to get access to the door. Um, so yeah, unfortunately our need for volunteer, you know, one other volunteer that I, that I do uh, recruit every year is a Spanish speaking scuba diver. I have Spanish speaking families that I want to honor by speaking their language their child's going to participate in my program. I need someone that knows the program. I have a couple of my divers who are Spanish speaking, one that owns a company in Casterville, Caucasian man, but he knows his, his, his team of employees are mostly Spanish speaking. So he'll call the families up for me and make all the inroads, explain the program to the families. There's paperwork that they have to download on the website. Every, every nonprofit organization's got paperwork, and I got paperwork just like everybody else does, release forms photo release forms, that kind of stuff. I got a form that the family filled out that just tells me about their child, what their child's needs are. I need a few vital statistics like height, weight, and shoe size. I've got some kids coming because of their disability who are in their low teens, 10, 11, 12, 13, they're over six feet tall. I gotta make sure, and I got some wee ones that are just like almost infant size. We gotta make sure we got gear to, to cover that whole spectrum of kids, and we do. So it's, we, that, that's the kind of information that I garner from my, from my families. Great questions. I love it. What else? So this is your Good. I'm here. 
if anyone, for instance, I, I have cards, if somebody wants to take a card, if they have a friend or a relative, um, Robert can, can make that available too. If anybody online wants to uh, 